Are you like most sales and other professionals who want to grow their wealth faster than what they are currently doing through their company 401k, even with that company match, the stock market, or just plain saving money? Would you sleep better at night if you had the financial freedom to be job optional in just three to five years through investing in real assets? Maybe you don't want to stop working, but wouldn't it be cool if you could retire a decade earlier than most and do the traveling you and your family have planned for years while you're still young and can enjoy it? Let's face it, most busy professionals don't have the time or desire to take on more work outside of their W-2 to grow their wealth. On The Wealth Flow, each week we share the stories, the investments, and take a deep dive into the various asset classes that can deliver that accelerated growth to your portfolio passively. That's right, no extra work for you. Instead, we'll put your money to work. Learn what the 95% aren't talking about and join the top 5% of earners today on The Wealth Flow. Okay, welcome to the Wealth Flow. My guest today is Jamie Lima. Jamie is a certified financial planner. He's also a certified divorce financial um is it planner? Analyst. No, analysis. Analyst. analyst. Yeah. Okay, uh, got it. Uh formerly with uh Morgan Stanley, uh Fidelity Investments and now has Woodson um financial uh management. And so, Jamie, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Uh, I want to maybe start as I always do, and that's really kind of with your background, um, kind of what got you into uh, financial management, that kind of thing. Uh, but really, where did you grow up? You know, give us your give us your story. Oh, man, we're going way back into, in the time you, machine. We're going way back. Way that's back right. in the time machine. Well... Keith, it was a cold, dark December night in 1977. <laughs> I'm only kidding. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm originally from the East Coast, born and raised in a tiny little, tiny little town in the tiny little state of Rhode Island. And okay. I, I grew up there. I, I, I left there when I was around the age of 20 because I had had enough of shoveling snow. And I knew early on that I'm not a cold weather person. So... I had a, had a friend of mine who had moved to San Diego, California, when we were in high school. And I would come out in the summers and spring break and things of that nature just to hang out and, and, and keep, keep in touch with him and fell in love with it. And, and um, I decided roughly around the age of 20 that I had, had again, had had enough of shoveling snow and packed up all of my belongings and the $1,500 I had saved over the summer at that time. And packed up the car and drove as far as I could get without having to swim. Okay. And, and I, so I stayed out here. Um, I actually met my now ex-wife at the time. So we got together and uh, built our relationship and, and uh, then started having, you know, raised a family, so on and so forth. But um, when I was, when I came out here, I worked odd jobs. I was a bellman at the Marriott. So I, I can carry bags. I can pull, I can push those bell carts really, really well around the, around the building. I worked in restaurants. I was a restaurant manager for, for like I think five years or something. And I had just, I realized at the time I was like, I'm either going to be in the restaurant business for the rest of my life, or I'm going to be, you know, go do something different. And I had always had a passion for finance, uh, which we can, we can delve a little bit deeper into where that stemmed from later, but if you want, but, um, so I, I ended up get, going back and finishing my my fi degree in finance, and then was able to cut my teeth in the uh, financial services industry at a company called Morgan Stanley. They gave me my first shot at getting into this into this world uh, around 2005 or so, and okay. I never looked back. Yeah, so I left the restaurant business, which is kudos to anybody who's in it because it is, it is very very challenging. And I just, you know, I was working till midnight, one o'clock in the morning, and then, you know, getting a few hours of sleep, getting back to open up the restaurant in the morning. And it wasn't conducive to, for me to raise a family that way. So I wanted, I wanted something a little more nine to five, which, and, you know, uh, I had a passion for finance too. So it's something that uh, just, just fit well with me. So that's, uh, that's where I, I, I cut my teeth. And again, 2005 at Morgan went to Fidelity Investments in 2011, where I was there for nine years, and then 
just more, more recently I've launched my own wealth management company three years ago. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah. And prior to, uh, as far as that industry goes, uh, prior to opening up your own uh, firm, did you, uh, is there a certain requirement as far as regulations that you work underneath somebody else's license for X amount of time or how, how does that work? Uh, well, as far as the licenses go, the FINRA licenses, which is the financial regulatory authority that we, we have to, um, uh, be a part of, and they, they oversee mm -hmm. our licenses with Morgan Stanley and Fidelity Investments. I had to have my series seven designation, my series 31 and the series 66. I, I had the 66. You can do 63 or 65, I think too. Um, also have a California insurance license. So they, you know, they, it was, a, they were, it was a great learning ground and a great proving ground for me. And they were able to get me all the sure. destinations I need to do the work. With, with Woodson Wealth Management, because we are a registered investment advisory firm, the only requirement really is our 65 to, or, or to be a CFP and have a certain number of years of experience. As okay. far as the certified financial planner designation goes, I don't recall off the top of my head exactly what the requirements are. Um, Hours wise, I want to say it's something like you have to have 4,000 hours of financial planning experience working alongside another advisory firm. It's somewhere between 2,000 and 4,000, whatever the number is, it's very large. Um, they want to make sure right. that you have the ample amount of experience to be able to do the work that we do. You also have to have a certain level of education. And then you, I, I think you have to work three years for a firm and then a certain number of hours as well doing planning. And there's a whole year long course that you have to take, which I, I believe now is seven modules. When I took it, it was six. So you have to go through seven different training courses. They have to do a capstone course, a, a case study. And then that allows you to sit for the exam, which when I took it, it was a two day exam. They've, they've, they've been able to consolidate it now down to one. So yeah, a um, lot of education, a lot of education and experience sure. that yeah. I've, I've had to have to get over the years. All right. Maybe before we move too much further down the road, um, if maybe you could tell us, you know, kind of why you've always had the passion for finance. Good question. When I tell the story all the time, but in one of my, one of my good friends, the gentleman that I, I mentioned earlier who had moved to San Diego, his name is Richard. He, we, we grew up together. We were in diapers together. Effectively. We, we we've been close, close friends for year, our entire lives. And my parents went through a divorce in two, uh, when I was about seven or eight years old, somewhere mm -hmm. in that range. And I specifically remember there was a time when we're, we're sitting there, we're sitting there in the kitchen, and I remember them walking in the door. And they had a, ba a box of groceries, like a Dole banana box of groceries that, you know, the Dole banana boxes that you see at the grocery store. I remember they had a Dole banana box full of groceries and they put it down on the counter. And it clicked for me, even at that young age that things were very, very tight. You know, my mom was having, mm. a, having a hard time keeping food on the table. My dad, I, I remember him working two jobs. You know, he was, he worked during the day in his, you know, his, his eight to five, his nine to five type of job. And then he would work in the evenings and do masonry work because he, he grew up as a mason. And even then with the two jobs and she was doing some odd jobs, it was just really tough to keep a, a roof over the, the kid's heads and, and food in our bellies. And I remember, I remember going through the experience, that experience and thinking, if I ever have kids, I'm never going to, I'm going to make sure that what, I'm going to do whatever I have to do to ensure that they never have to have the same experience yeah. and they never have to have that financial stress and concerns. And that's effectively what propelled me into doing what I do because you, I don't know about you or and, and your listeners, but I tended to gravitate towards the thing that I didn't have. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah. Well, you know, I mean, like, you know, I could have gravitated to, towards better looks too, I think, but um, it's a face only a mother could love. But I, I gravitated towards finance because of that experience. And and now, uh, you know, I went through a divorce myself in 2017. And now on a, I'm on a mission uh, to make sure other people don't have those same experiences going through their divorce and on the financial planning side as well. Yeah. What, uh, what about different surprises? Maybe, um, you know, anytime you get into a new, uh, new industry and obviously this isn't new for you anymore, but at the time were there were there any surprises as to what was effective as far as growing wealth? What wasn't, uh, what were some of the lessons maybe that you've learned along the way? That's a great question. I, I think 
things have changed over the last, you know, couple of decades of me doing this because I've been doing this creeping up on 20 years now. Technology has made things a lot different. They, you know, there, there, there was a time when you would be able to, you'd had to call your stockbroker, i.e. me, right. in order to place a stock trade. We were the ones that you had to go to, to build your financial plan and make sure you kept it on track and so on and so forth. Now things have changed in such a way where technology drives a lot of that. I still think there's a place for us as humans to have the human connection in building out financial plans for our clients and making sure that they're on track. And, you know, I just had a call before we got, we jumped on this one with husband and wife who are really struggling with balancing out the demands that they have with the kids and we're saving for retirement. And now the student loans are going to kick in and so on. I don't think technology or robot can help them navigate those types of discussions and the decisions that they have to make. But technology does, can, you can leverage technology in a lot of ways to help grow wealth that doesn't exist, didn't exist 20 years ago when I started. I mean, you can place a stock trade in two seconds with, you know, wherever you are. You could be walking through Disneyland and places a stock trade. You could be sitting on your couch, piece of cake. You don't have to call us anymore to, to really build true wealth. But what that's done, though, is, and I don't know if you have kids or not, but or if your listeners, okay. if your listeners have kids, there is this, I guess, a um, uh, a mentality of instant gratification. And right. what I found is, is that over the years, because technology has driven a lot of that, people get very, very frustrated with the low, the, the long, slow slog that they have to go through in order to build wealth over the long haul. They want to be, they want to place trades and they want to make money and they want to you know, do day trading and leverage their portfolio for you know, margin accounts and all this other stuff. And I'm like, what are you doing? Every, everybody I know has crypto. Everybody I know yeah. has access to crypto, which again, didn't exist 20 years ago. And I, I, I believe there's a place for it, but a lot of people are doing it because they think they're going to go from, you know, they put a hundred dollars in their account. It's going to be worth a thousand dollars tomorrow. It right. doesn't work that way. Yeah. And, and I, so I think, I think that's the greatest experience that I've seen or greatest change and challenge and eye opening thing that I've seen over the course of the last few years is there's a lot more of this instant gratification that people are looking for. And it, it just, I'm sorry to disappoint, but it doesn't work that way. Yeah. And, uh, I'm go back to one of the things that you said about, you know, one of the, th one of the things that the technology can't necessarily do for you is that personal touch, you know, being able to understand when you're consulting with somebody mm -hmm. that, you know, oftentimes people feel like they are on their own, you know, they're doing something that maybe not everybody else is experiencing. And so just that reassurance of working with you and knowing that, you know, uh, this is an, an issue and a problem that a lot of people face. And um, here's how we, you know, get get through that. Uh, Absolutely. And that's I tell people all the time, you know, even though I've been saying this thing to you or I've, I've been saying this thing that I'm saying to clients for almost 20 years now, you're just hearing it for the first time. And the reason why that happens is because so many of the people that we work with are experiencing the same things. Obviously, everybody's situation is different. Personalities are different. Goals are different so on and so forth. But if you're somewhere between the age of 30 and 50, which are the, a lot of the clients that we work with, you're probably concerned about your own retirement, maybe aging parents and, and make sure that mm -hmm. they're, they're taken care of and, and um, medically and financially. Guaranteed you're worried about your job because you have to be able to keep a roof over your head and perform at work and so on. And then you have little Johnny and Susie who are, who are also there that you're trying to figure out how you're going to pay for their college and keep them well fed and so on and so forth. And you have all these spinning plates and all these competing priorities. And again, everybody's situation is different, but from a 36,000 foot perspective, most people that are in that age range are dealing with all those things. And that's what we, we do on a daily basis. And it's the same thing on the divorce side. Everybody that we work with on the divorce financial planning stuff, they, they want to make sure that it, they can get a fair and equitable settlement. They don't want to look back five years and make and look and go, wow, I should have, would have, could have on some some decisions. And mm -hmm. they they don't they want to feel like they walked away with not getting screwed by the courts and their ex-spouse. And that's that's what we do. Even though every situation is different, those are the those are the that's the overarching um, theme, so to speak, uh, on the divorce side. Let's maybe stay on that divorce side mm -hmm. a little bit. Um, you know, when I think of divorce and um, as we were sharing ahead of the show, um, you know, I've gone through uh, divorce as well. 
Uh, I was fairly young at the time. Um, and I say fairly young. I mean, I was in my early 30s, so mm-hmm. wasn't that young. But uh, it, it uh, and at that time, uh, I had kind of gone through an up and a down as far as uh, our, our own economics uh, at the house. I you know, was a full time real estate broker, went through 27 uh, 2007, 2008, and, uh, really saw a lot of my wealth kind of go away. Um, but, um, so there wasn't a whole lot to fight over, <laughs> I guess yeah. is, the, is, is the point at that, at that particular point in time. But, you know, I know we worked through a, an attorney and I think a lot of folks, when they hear divorce, they think attorney, tell, tell me how, you know, your role in, in, you know, really helping to guide somebody through that process. Um, yeah, I appreciate the question. It's, it's a it's a good one because a lot of people don't really understand the work that we do. We come in, and I, I tell people all the time, our value prop, our value proposition, is we are going to do all the work that your attorney doesn't really know how to do very well and very mm-hmm. effectively and efficiently, i.e., the financial stuff. And don't get me wrong, if you're an attorney, you're listening. I'm sure you're amazing at the job that you do, and and I, I know a lot of amazing attorneys. But a lot of them also don't know the difference between an IRA and a Roth IRA, or Mm -hmm. that you can take distributions out of your retirement account without the penalty at the time the quadro is filed. All these little nuances of taxation, things of that nature, they don't understand all the nuances of it. What their job is to do is get you from point A to point B, do whatever they can to rack up as many billable hours as they can along the way, and help you get to a settlement. Mm -hmm. Is it fair and equitable? Who knows? Because if they're doing the math on it, it may or may not be. So we come in and, and we, we, we are, I tell people all the time, like my job is to help you not burn those hours with your attorney. Let us offload the financial work to us and we'll go through the exercise of gathering all your financial documents and learning more about your goals and objectives for the divorce. You know, do you want to keep the house or do you want to you know, keep your retirement account, things of that nature. And then we'll do we'll do all the financial work. We'll gather all the information. We'll put it in nice, clean reports for you, so you can understand what's. We'll create a, all the information. We'll create a balance sheet for you, so you can understand what would be a fair and equitable settlement. You know, maybe there's an IRA over here, and there's a four hundred one k over here. And we have to make sure that there's there in equilibrium. We'll also help man, make sure you don't make any tax mistakes along the way. We'll help with um, asset division, property division, child support, spousal support calculations, all the financial stuff. And it may sound counterintuitive, again, to hire two people to do this work. You have your attorney on one side and you have me on the other. However, if I can do the work more effectively, efficiently, and reduce the amount of billable hours that the attorney is going to use doing that work, because they're not an expert in that space, usually you come right. out ahead. and that's that's effectively what we do. What about uh, maybe things that you have proposed uh, to a client that's going through divorce that that was a surprise to them or even a surprise to the attorney as far as, oh, can you do that type of thing? Is there some instances like that that you can maybe discuss? Yeah, I, I think I think it's the 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 big one always is the distribution of assets from a retirement account. So when you go through the exercise of dividing up your assets from a 401k or an IRA or what have you, in, in normal circumstances, when you take money out of that account to go you know, live your life or what have you, you're going to pay ordinary income taxes on that at that time. Right. If you're under the age of 59 and a half, you're going to pay 10% penalty on top of that because... The IRS, the IRS is basically saying like that's the, these are the rules that are in place. You have to be 59 and a half to, to be able to take distributions out. However, once the quadro is completed and those assets are starting to be di- divided amongst spouses, there is a one-time exact exemption under the 72T rules that are in place that will allow you to take a money out without the 10% penalty. And mm-hmm. that is the time when usually there's one spouse that says, you know, it, and I Certainly not trying to be sexist here, but I've, in my experience, it's mostly the the women that are involved in in these cases that need the money to be able to go buy new furniture or you know maybe move to a different location with the kids and and what have you. And by reducing it by being able to take money out of the retirement account, now you're going to still pay ordinary income taxes on it, but the likelihood is that your income's 
very low at that point, so it's not going to be too painful, but it's the 10% penalty that you're going to avoid as well. And that surprises a lot of people. A lot of, a lot of attorneys don't, don't understand that nuance. And then secondarily, the division of assets uh, relating to retirement accounts and homes. Mm -hmm. Sometimes what I see is the agreement as well. You know, I'm going to the, the wife is going to keep the house because there's five hundred thousand dollars in equity in it. Husband's going to keep his retirement account because there's five hundred thousand dollars in assets in it. And it would seem on the surface that it's a wash. However, right when I when she sells the property over here, when when she sells the property, she's going to get a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar exemption on the capital gains taxes that she could potentially potentially pay. So she's going to pay much lower tax, whereas. The husband on the other side is paying taxes at his ordinary income tax rates, regardless whether he takes a dollar out or he cashes out the whole thing. There's no there's no yeah. tax benefit on that side. So on the surface, it looks equal, but there is definitely um, swayed one one direction in, in another direction tax wise. Yeah, that's a good point. I wouldn't have necessarily thought of that. I mean, obviously, I've known for the primary residence, you know, and being married, uh, it's like two. Uh, what? 500 for a married 500 couple, married, 250 for yeah. Yeah, single. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, um, yeah, that's interesting. What about, um, maybe let's jump out of the divorce piece of things. <laughs> uh, but it is very interesting and I think it's, uh, I think it's good. Uh, but if you're advising maybe a young family, um, you know, you talked a little bit about college planning, um, you know, let's let's maybe dive into that just a little bit as to what options are available now and, you know, what you've seen that's worked out really well. Absolutely. I think the the one thing I, I we go to all the time is leveraging five to nine college savings plans. The these these plans, when I started years and years and years ago, they they were just pretty plain vanilla. They were boring. There wasn't a lot you could do with them. Your investment options were pretty stale. They've they've come a long way over the last couple of decades, and now especially with things like the new Save program that's available for um, uh, for for student loan borrowers, also with um, some of the rules that were put in place or with the tax law changes uh, a short while ago, a five two nine college savings plan can be an incredibly useful, powerful investment for people that have kids mainly for a couple of different reasons. One, you can use the assets that are in there that have been saved for K through 12 now. So if you want to put little Johnny or little Susie into a private school for their high school or maybe for the middle years, you can use those the monies for, for K through 12. Also, another rule that came into place was that if you don't use the money in those accounts after they've finished school and, and um, you've paid for it out, out of some portion of it out of that account. Let's say there's twenty five thousand dollars left in that account when when they're done. You can then convert that to a Roth IRA on the child's behalf. Hmm. So okay. now okay. you put twenty five thousand dollars into a Roth IRA, which will grow tax deferred and come out tax free fifty years into the future when they're ready to use it. Forty years into the future when they're ready to use it. And it's it, it and not to mention the investment options are so much better. There's index solutions, there's asset allocation solutions. It's not just, now, don't get me wrong, you're not going to be able to, to diversify across multiple fund families and things of that nature. But in the old days, you'd have five, five funds to choose from. Now you probably have 25, which is, which, which is a, a big deal. Yeah, for sure. And, and as far as the money that you're contributing into this college account, mm -hmm. uh, is that tax free? Is that something that uh, you 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 know before you receive it, you do, or is this tax dollars that you're putting into the account that's growing tax free? I guess clarify that. Piece sure, absolutely. For me. The the money that you put into the account is is money that is after tax money. It, it's Okay. After you've take, paid taxes from your paycheck and you've put it into your checking account, then you write a check to the 529 plan. Some states do have a tax benefit for contributions to it. I'm here in the state of California. Unfortunately, we do not. Okay. Uh, kind of a dying breed of states that are, are allowing that. Uh, but I, I do believe there are some, I don't know off the top of my head which ones they are, but I do believe there are some that will allow you to do, uh, if you make a contribution, there is a tax benefit at the state level. Um, 
Yeah, they're, they're pretty cut and dried. I mean, they're they're it's the way I look at it is it's it's kind of like your four hundred one k at work, mm -hmm. where it's earmarked for a particular goal, i.e., college year, where four hundred one k would be uh, earmarked for retirement, and you can just set up systematic contributions to it: fifty bucks, a hundred bucks, five hundred dollars a month, whatever the number is, and that just continues to goes in the portfolio that you pick, and will continue to to grow over time. It's a, it's a, it's an amazing tool. I'm, I'm, I'm glad we have that to leverage. Yeah, for sure. And you mentioned something else about, um, student loans and being able to offset, uh, I think it was the interest or something, but what, uh, tell me a little bit about, uh, the, the rule changes and kind of what, what's happened. There. Yeah. Well, with, with student loans, you're a little bit limited what you can do with the five two nine plan. The, okay. um, and I, and I, we have a college planning expert on my team. His name is Drew. He's an amazing at the work that he does. And, and from my conversations with him, my understanding is that you can only use $10,000 out of the 529 account to pay down student loans later if, if the child happened to take them out. Okay. But with the, with the save plan that has come down the pike, uh, or just recently, this is, this stems from, from Biden's inability to get the, um, uh, ten thousand or twenty thousand dollar forgiveness completed. The oh, okay. save plan came about, and there are some nuances there that um, you. There are some definitely tax benefits there, but um, also the one thing that I'm seeing now is a lot of clients are going through the uh, changing the type of of payment plan that they have within their for their student loans, and it's when they start when they kick back in in, in October, it's going to save them you know some serious cash. Uh, every month, the the couple that I was I mentioned is, uh, a short while ago that I was talking to earlier today. That was the conversation we had. W which strategy do we want to go with based on you know your income levels now, the challenges you're facing, balancing out all the demands that you have to uh, from a budgeting perspective every month. So I mean, more details to come. It's still very very new as far as what the save plan uh, actually entails and some of the benefits of it. But um, it'd be something to look at for your listeners that ha have student loans. There are income repayment plans that are, are will will factor in some forgiveness on the tail end, which is which is a big big change. Yeah, that's great. Okay, and uh, and then what about just general retirement? Um, you know, if you've got somebody, um, you know, maybe maybe taking two different examples here, mm -hmm. uh, but if you've got somebody that's an early, you know, new family, they're starting out, and they've got a little bit more runway, uh, kind of the uh, the first levers that you'll pull, uh, to, to kind of put in place to help them. And then, um, on the, on the other side of that, maybe somebody who's gotten a late start, that's trying to catch up at this particular point in time. Sure. We've come across that a lot for sure. Um, for the first, for first scenario and for any scenario with any client scenario we have, we, we are financial planners at heart. Everybody on my team is a certified financial planner. So we always start to build the plan for them. And that's just a mathematical exercise of learning about what they have coming in, what they have going out, what they've saved so far and so on, and putting that into the, the software we use, which is you know, for our financial planning software we use, and help them just give, get an understanding of what those projections look like. like where, are we, where are we today and mm -hmm. where are we headed? And what I found is that usually we're in a much better spot than they think, because a lot of people think that they've, they've started too late or what have you. And this goes for the older folks as well. But um, what we do is we create these projections and the very first lever we pull is usually on the investment side. Because okay. some people are good at the investments. Some people are not so good. We deal with a lot, a lot of people that are out there that are just okay. Right. And we can, there's, there's, there's room of, there's room for improvement for most portfolios is what I found. And what we'll do is we'll go in and we'll look at figuring out what they have today, what, the, what they've saved and what their investments look like, how much do they have some stock bonds and cash and how does that, what does that do to the portfolio? What does that do to the projections? I should say. And then when we start, we can start to move the levers, so to speak, and to say, okay, well, what if we get a little more aggressive? What if we get a little more conservative? And then with in real time, we can show them, okay, if you if you do this thing, then this is what how it's going to impact your financial plan. And our job is always to help them improve it. Then we can take that information and use it to build a portfolio around those parameters. 
what I tend to see happen is a lot of people come in and they, you know, they pick this fund or that fund or this ETF or that ETF and they have a bunch of crypto or whatever it is. And it's a little bit of a mishmash. Our job is to mm-hmm. come in and clean it up and make it and put it in, in a nice organized, fat, diversified portfolio and get them on a, on a much smoother path moving forward. That's on the, that, for the younger, mostly for the younger crowd. Similar scenario with the older crowd. However, a lot of times we need to help them manage the budget and, and sometimes just manage their expectations because yeah. I, I, I've, I'll tell you the story about a gal that I used to work with. I worked with, a, I worked for Fidelity Investments. I was there for, for nine years and I specifically remember the time I worked with an executive from Pepsi, PepsiCo. She okay. walked into my office and we had a couple meetings and what have you. And when I finally started looking at her budget and realizing that she was burning $25,000 a month, we're here in, or at the time I was living in Orange County, California, a very, very expensive part of, part of California. So she had a very expensive lifestyle and she had, you know, three or $4 million saved at the time, whatever the number was relatively young. I, I would want to say she was probably 48, 50, maybe somewhere in that range. Okay. And I had to tell her that she was not going to be able to retire when she wanted to retire. I couldn't remember if I can't remember if that was five years later or what would have you. But I, I literally had to tell her, like, you're burning $300,000 a year on $3 million in assets. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to realize that a 10% withdrawal rate is not going to last that long. So I'm, she, she got up, she got all upset, walked out of my office, never heard from her again. But that happens all the time. Like we have to, we have to set the expectation of what your life is going to look like, and we do that through yeah. all you know, the tools and resources that we have. The good news is, is that a lot, like I said earlier, a lot of people that come in feel like they're in a worse spot, but they're actually it's not actually not that bad. And when we can help them understand, like okay, we just need to make some adjustments to the investments. Maybe we need to watch the budget a little bit. Maybe you're going to have to work a year longer. And, but to be able to give them that information so they can sleep better at night, it's, it's super helpful. And, and we do that a lot with the older crowd that we work with. Yeah, that's good. And I would, uh, I, do you do anything as far as automating some of the stuff? You know, I know just in my personal life, Jamie, um, just trying to, you know, trying to set aside that money, um, at least in the early ages, mm-hmm. it was difficult. And so I've got things automated so that before I even hit, you know, see it in my regular checking account, it's already been distributed where I want it to go. Uh, and that to me has been a game changer. Yeah, we, we are 100%, uh, 100% virtual wealth management company. So we, we try to leverage automation and technology wherever we possibly can, even in the, the, the practice of running the business. For for our clients, that's the one thing that I try to you know, get them to grasp uh, on a regular basis. Is you know it's e- it's easy to do the four hundred one k. I think if you have a four hundred one k, it's pretty easy. It's kind of standard fare. Pick a percentage mm-hmm. that you're going to put away, and and people are used to that. But saving in outside brokerage accounts, adding to their Roth IRA, things of that nature, it, it can be a little bit more complex. Um, Sometimes they want to do things ad hoc where, you know, they may have a, bo- a bonus that comes in quarterly and they're going to decide how much they're going to put away into a brokerage account or a retirement account. And it can be, you know, maybe it's a thousand dollars this quarter, two thousand dollars the next quarter. It can be a little bit more sporadic. I'm a big fan of, of doing that systematically, even if it's only a few hundred dollars every month versus these lump sums along the way, because it takes the emotion out of, uh, out of the equation. Right. A lot of the folks that we talk to that do that ad hoc addition, those are ad hoc additions to their investments, they give you the old, well, is today the right day? I don't know. Biden was on TV today and he was talking about this thing. And I saw on CNN that thing was going on. Or I turned on CNBC today and Jim Cramer was spouting his, you know, his stuff at me. I don't really know. Like the, the, the world is such a you know, challenging place right now. I think I'm going to hold off and I'll, I'll invest when the time is right. That time never comes. Yeah. There's always a reason to not invest. There's always a, every day is a bad day to invest. So if you can set it up systematically like you're doing, you take all that emotion out of the way and the, 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 you go to the IQ versus the EQ and that's where you're going to build long-term wealth. Like I, we kind of circling back to what we talked about earlier, it's a slow slog, 
and you have what you have if you can do it systematically it takes a lot of that pressure off for you to figure out what when the best day to invest is yeah and as far as uh just kind of somebody maybe going back to somebody who's just starting out um, and I'm asking cause I've got a daughter who's just starting out, you know, and, uh, I've tried to give her as much advice as I can, but just curious more than anything else, if there's, uh, something that, you know, if it was your daughter, uh, what would you do to, to say, Hey, look, you know, you're going to be, she's making decent money. Um, but, um, you know, uh, just where, where should she be putting things at this particular point in time? My, my wife and I have done the, gone through this exercise ourselves. We have five kids between the two of us. And uh, three of them are now college age. Uh, we have a, I have a junior in high school, and then my my youngest is just turned eleven. But the, for the three older ones, the very first thing that we did we we gave them one year where they could work, earn money, and have fun with it. My yeah. my stepson went on, you know, he was able to get a, a nice car for himself, um, and then you know he put some rims on it and he new brakes and all this other stuff, and he's doing his he's doing his car thing. Right. Um, and, and it's the same thing with the other kids. We're just letting them feel themselves out, learn how to, you know, learn how to get a paycheck and learn how to spend appropriately and so on. But in year two, what we do is we basically we say, OK, well, we're going to pick a number. What number do you feel comfortable with? And then every let's say it's you know hundred dollars a month or two hundred dollars a month. Great. We're going to take that number. We're going to we're going to put it into a retirement account for you. And we match that number as their parent. Now it's probably not going to yeah. last forever, but in the first couple of years, we're going to help them get get set up and, and get underway. <clears throat> and my my stepson in particular, his name is Brandon, and he's he he'll Venmo me money, and he's like, okay, stocks, you know, like like invest, you know, it's it's hilarious because now he's getting an understanding of how this all works, and it's a it's a great lesson for him to learn at the age of twenty how the stock market works because they don't teach for you this sure. stuff in school. So what I would recommend for your daughter and, and people that are listening, if that have kids, set up a Roth IRA for them. Let them put their money away, you know, $50, $25, whatever the number is, you know, after they get their first jobs. I wish I had somebody tell me how to do this stuff because I would be, you know, maybe having this conversation with you from my yacht. But um, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's an amazing lesson and, and, and something that they just don't teach in school and they can get hands-on experience with it at a very young age. And then, um, yeah, I, I think I lost, kind of lost my train of thought here, but I, I think that's a, that's a great lesson. Oh, and then what I was, was going to say was, if, you, if you're a business owner, if you're a business mm -hmm. owner, you can also hire your children to do work for the business tax-free. Mm -hmm. I don't remember the number off the top of my head. I don't remember. I need another cup of coffee to remember this number, I think. But um, I, I want to say it's somewhere in the neighborhood of like $10,000 a year or something, somewhere in that range. Uh, look it up, but you can hire your kids to work in your business. You can pay them a wage and it's a tax. It's an investment from the business, right? Because the business gets to write off that wage, but also the child gets to pay, doesn't have to pay any taxes on that money. So that's a pretty oh, wow. cool lever to pull tax wise. Yeah. Yeah. That is neat. What about, um, you know, I always hear about fees and uh, different things depending on like whether certain mutual funds, you know, when you look at all the fees attached to them, it really kind of uh, curves uh, your, you know, earnings down a little bit. And what, what have you seen there? What's what's something to kind of be on the lookout for when you're evaluating, you know, those type of investments? You have, you have got to be cognizant of fees. If you are, if you are not looking at, the fund information, whether it's an ETF or a mutual fund, whatever investment you're making, if you're not paying attention to the fees, you're you're hurting yourself. We the, in the term the term we use in our industry is called fee drag. So our job mm -hmm. as advisors, my and we're, everybody on my team is a certified financial planner, so we have to operate in a fiduciary capacity. Our job every day, day in day out, is to reduce the amount of fees our clients are paying, so they can build wealth over the long haul. That's why the work that we do, we do, we're a fee only company. So we don't have commissions involved. There's no sales quotas. We don't have products. So, you know, we don't sell any products. All we sell is the advice that we're giving. And the client pays for that. It's a very transparent fee that they're paying us. It's all outlined in black and white. Not every company operates that way. Even amazing companies that are like uh, Fidelity Investments, which I work for, 
you know, they're not necessarily all that transparent in with the fees that you're paying. How does the advisor get paid? Nobody ever knows, right? Nobody ever talks about it. What kind of fee right. if, if you're if they're managing your investments? Well, you're paying them a fee to manage the investments, but they're also making a fee on the funds that they're using. So there are multiple layers of fees and you have to be very cognizant of that. We, we as a firm, we offer a free fee analysis for everybody that every prospective client. I don't care if you work with there us you or you decide to go in a different direction. We'll schedule, we would schedule time together, you know, half an hour or so. Let's just get some information about where your assets are held and what types of accounts you have and so on. It will help you dissect what you, the, the fees that you're paying. Um, it's, 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 it's very, very important. A lot of people don't even know that they're paying fees inside of their mutual funds that they own in their 401k right. and in other accounts. You look at them and you're like, okay, well, wow, that, that fund cost you one and a half percent a year. I'm like, wait, what? What are you talking about? I have, I don't pay anything. No, you don't pay anything. They're just taking it out of the returns. So if the portfolio, right. if, if you're, if the, if, if that fund should have been up 10%, you're only getting eight and a half because they're taking their fee off the top. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's one of those things, like you said, you don't see it necessarily. It's kind of like taxes, you know, you don't, you, although I don't know, I, I see the taxes coming out, but, uh, uh, it's one of those things that you don't necessarily pay attention to. I wasn't, you know, didn't pay attention to it early on. Um, I, I did a little bit of it, you know, changing around, do it a little bit more as far as index funds, that kind of stuff where the, the fees are, are, are pretty low. Um, and you know, I feel like it made it, it made a difference. So You're, if 1% fee drag on a million dollar portfolio, that's real money. It's $10,000 a year yeah. in fees that you're paying unnecessarily. And now as we're just talking through this, I don't, I don't know why I've never had this thought before, but how amazing would it be if every month that you got your, you received your 401k statement or your, your st statement from your broker. And on the bottom, not only do they include the management cost, because there's a management cost if somebody's managing your portfolio, but also the mm -hmm. cost of the literally down to the dollar of all the ex, all the ex fund expense ratios and what that how that's impacted the plan, the, 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 the portfolio. You know, maybe there's a line item that says, you know, you paid three thousand two hundred and fifty dollars in fund fees. That would be eye opening, but they don't do that. It's not as transparent as it maybe as it should be. Yeah, no, I think that's a great idea. That'd be good to good to have, and certainly uh, could be an advantage. Um, so we'll, we'll expect expect that Woodson Wealth Management will start putting that on their uh, <laughs> on their return. It's a it's a good point. Uh, I, I we may look into seeing if we can figure out a way to do that. Yeah. Um, what about uh, so? How about uh, tax planning uh, for maybe we've talked about folks that are trying to get to that retirement level, trying to build up their nest egg. But what about those folks that have got it built up? Maybe they've already retired. Um, you know, what kind of tax planning um, things should they be aware of? Another good question. I, I, the one thing that we work with a lot of people on are even if even if you're retired, there may be opportunities to do things like Roth conversions. And converting some of the traditional IRA monies that you have into into a Roth account, and I keep going back to Roth because I think it's an amazing opportunity. It's not for everybody. We we do a lot of Roth conversion analyses for for our, our clients, and you know, fifty percent it works, fifty percent it doesn't. But that would be one area that we I, I think is incredibly important um, because if you're in retirement, you probably have a little bit lower wage now, lower uh, lower income at then than you did while you were working. And, and it might be prime time to do some Roth conversions, especially even going into you know, 2022 when uh, the markets were down you know, plus 20 percent. We ran in uh, analyses all, all day long for clients because we're like, OK, do we want to take a take a shot at this? And while the market's down, convert some of that money to an IRA. And then when it recovers, you now have much more money in your pocket in the long run. The other thing I think that people miss a lot is tax loss harvesting. That's a big one. We we have we have a lot of clients that have after tax accounts, you know, non retirement type of accounts, and mm -hmm. they tend to fall asleep at the wheel sometimes. And you have funds that are kicking off distributions in that account. You have some interest going to that account, and so on, and it's driving the income of that account up. And also, when you if you if you bought a, a security, a mutual fund, or a stock in your after tax account. And you've had a lot of gains over the last 10 or 20 years, 
because you invested in 2007, 2008, like you mentioned earlier with the, during the housing crisis, mm-hmm. which we can talk, we could probably spend an entire hour on that conversation because it was pretty gnarly. But, you know, if you, if you invested 20 years ago and now that money is, you know, three times as much as it was then, you have all these capital gains that are embedded in that account. So now you have, you have to take advantage of losses on, in certain aspects of your portfolio, sell a security, harvest that loss. So later on, when you sell something on the other side that is at a gain, you can, you can wipe out some of those, the, uh, the capital gains there. Not everybody does that well. Not, every, not a lot of people do it, if, especially if they're managing their own portfolio. Because it may sound counterintuitive to sell a security at a loss, but you you can leverage losses to gain on the on the, on the back end, uh, if that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah, it does. Um, you know, let's uh, let's maybe go back. I I think I may have ended our divorce conversation a little bit prematurely uh, because before the show we were talking a little bit about some of the things that you maybe learned in, in yours. Uh, you mind sharing that with the audience? I learned a lot. I learned personally, I learned if you have a gut instinct about something, you should go with it. Because <clears throat> when I, I wanted, I was a certified, I've been a certified financial planner for years and I was studying for that, that exam. And after I, after I finished and passed, I wanted to move on to the certified divorce financial analyst designation. And my branch manager at the time said, you know what, you don't really do that we don't really do that work here. It's just going to bog you down. So, you know, keep your head down, keep focused on your clients and move on. Well, sure enough, four years later, I go through the world's most expensive and challenging divorce ever. And I didn't have the, I don't, I don't, I didn't have the, the experience or the, the tools and resources that I have now at that time. And looking back, I, I certainly made some mistakes along the way, even as a financial pro, uh, professional. So relating to the divorce, I think one thing that we people make a mistake on all the time is the distribution of assets or the the, the fair uh, a quote unquote fair settlement of assets. And if you're listening and you're contemplating a divorce or you've, you're in the throes of it, I want you to pay attention to the type of asset that you're considering dividing up. If it's a property or your retirement accounts, after tax brokerage accounts, whatever. I just I hung up the phone about an hour ago with somebody who is in the process of um, sep- trying to find a way to, to sell their farm, an 80 acre farm to be able to to finalize a divorce. Whatever the asset is, you need to understand the taxation related to those types of investments. There are more tax benefits on by selling a house than there are taking money out of your retirement account. There are ways where you can get creative, where you can keep one spouse in the house and, and leverage that asset for a much longer period of time. There's there's a, just a lot that you can do. The, these little nuances along the way that I didn't know about when it was even going through my own divorce, where I'm looking back, I'm like, wow, I, I should have done this differently or should have done that differently. I think the biggest one is really asset division and making sure it's fair and equitable. But you know, no two accounts or no two types of accounts or types of assets are the are, are the same. If that if that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right. Um, and anything else that maybe we should know about just you know uh, financial planning and you know kind of about what the services that you uh, provide. I I'm biased, of course. I believe in financial planning because I've been doing it for so long and I, I, I but I've seen the benefits of, of the work that we do. I've seen people that come in that are so petrified about even opening up their statements to feeling you know safe and secure and like they're on the right path moving forward. There's there it, it, it just if a lot of any of your listeners out there are the DIYers and the people that are trying to do this on their own I would challenge them and say well you know like I can, I can try to go do, you know, open heart surgery or something like you, you want to trust the professionals in this space. For sure. Uh, it's, it's okay. If in, in a lot of ways to have a play account or an account that, you know, you want to be able to dabble and buy crypto and trade stock options, things of that nature. Maybe that's only 10 or 20% of your overall wealth. Let the other 80% be managed by professionals. And, and we don't we don't have to manage client portfolios either. That's the beauty of working with us. We I don't we're product and platform agnostic. 
I don't care if you have your money at Fidelity or Schwab or Morgan Stanley or whatever, we can still work with you. So we're not, this is not an asset grab. But if you work with a professional like us, we can at least help make sure you're on the right track moving forward and not make mistakes along the way. And maybe, maybe that's just a, you work with us for a year and then you go up, we get everything dialed in and put you on the right path moving forward. And you just take that information and run with it. We don't have long-term commitments. We're not asking anybody to sign a contract that says you're going to work with us for the next 20 years. We we're, we just do things differently. And, and I feel like if you're trying to try to go it alone, you better be willing to deal with the consequences of that. It, it can. I've seen some people make some mistakes along the way that because they were trying to maybe because they were trying to save a few bucks and and it cost them uh, pretty sizably. Yeah. And you mentioned earlier about being a fiduciary and I, you know, I think most people understand what that is, but maybe if you can explain that a little bit, I know myself, um, you know, getting my real estate, uh, license and then my broker's license, we too had to take class specifically on being a fiduciary. Um, so maybe I have a little bit more knowledge on that than, than, you know, some of the other listeners, but what does that mean? Um, and how is that an advantage? By being a fiduciary, we have to put your needs and wants and goals and objectives above our own. And we are legally bound to put you to avoid conflicts of interest and to give you the highest and best advice possible. Not every advisor that is out there abides by that standard of care. And what they do is they say, well, it, 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 we're only required to provide you with suitable advice, meaning mm. Keith, you know, like I think this annuity would be suitable for you or this mutual fund would be suitable for you, or you should bring your money to the firm so we can manage it for you because that's suitable. However, if you take it to the next level from a fiduciary perspective, like I just mentioned a second ago, you may not need to bring your money to the firm, which is going to make us more money, right? Maybe right. doing what you're doing right now and keeping it where it is, is the best thing for you. We are obligated to tell you that. We are obligated to put you in a position where if we use a particular mutual fund or an exchange traded fund, it is in your best interest to do so. And we have to explain why, right? There are all these different, there's, it, it just takes it to the next level, so to speak. Like I get that it's suitable, but is it the best thing for you. Big difference. Yeah. And that's where we as in and as a certified financial planner, we've I've been, you know, I've I've operated that way my entire career. I, I don't understand how in general financial advisors don't, but the requirement as a CFP is to operate as a fiduciary, which is why the company that I run, Woodson, is fee only. Like we are a fee only wealth management company. I just wanted to get out of the the environment of cost conflicts of interest all the time. Mm -hmm. And now I can look myself in the mirror at the end of the night, at the end of the day and go, you know, you did, you did some pretty good work today. And the client is in a much better position because of the fiduciary work that we do. So ho hopefully that helps. Great. Yeah. Yeah, it does. Definitely. How about, how about, uh, can people find more about you, Jamie? And, uh, you know, if they're wanting to maybe have you do that fee analysis or possibly look at, uh, you know, uh, starting a relationship from a uh, with with your company, what is that? I would send them to the website woodsonwm.com. W o o d s o n w m. We are at the base of Mount Woodson here in San Diego, so which is where our namesake comes from, and kind of the the mountain okay. theme here. It's more like a hill. It's not really a, a big hill. It's not really. I don't want to call it a mountain, but it's Mount Woodson, and uh, that's that's where we we got our name. So just go to the website woodsonwm.com. Our entire team is, uh, you have access to our entire team there. You can just you know go to the very top of the page under about us, and then it'll tell you like share like our entire teams there, all of our background, our experience, ways to contact us, so on and so forth. I've been, I've been pretty lucky to be able to bring some amazing advisors to the team over the course of the last year. We have a, an estate planning attorney, a family law attorney. Uh, we have a co certified college financial consultant on the team. We have a retirement, uh, two retirement specialists. We even have a gentleman who's on the team who um, is LGBTQ friendly. Um, not that we all shouldn't be friendly, but 
his focus is on that community and he's very, very embedded in it. So he understands the nuances of those people that are in that community. So regardless of whether or not I'm the person that can help you, if we have this conversation and you, and you need some help, I can at least figure out who's going to be the best fit on the team for you and we can take it from there. Yeah, that's great. Okay. And then what about uh, when you're not working, Jamie? What, uh, what, what do you do? How do you spend your time? We, um, I, I mentioned I was just outside the, the uh, outside of San Diego. We're in a little town called Ramona, California, which is about 30 miles or so inland from, from San Diego proper. A little more rural area. And so we have, we have about an, uh, an acre of property, which is not much. Uh, but uh, my neighbors all have about you know five to eight, so we're all nice and spread out. It's a beautiful area up here, and we have a hobby farm. So when we bought the property uh, about five years ago now, we uh, four four and a half years ago now, we pulled in, fell in love with it, and on the property there is an old horse barn. It was a little dilapidated and it wasn't looking too great. But my wife, who has amazing vision, looked at looked at it and said, you know what, that would turn into an amazing bed and breakfast if we could just get it done right. So sure enough, we bought the property that same week, believe it or not. And then we tore, started tearing the thing down uh, a few weeks later. We rebuilt it and turned it into a, a, a farm stay, Airbnb, bed and breakfast type of setup here. So we have uh, too many chickens. We have way too many chickens. My wife is addicted to chickens. <laughs> um, sheep, goats, rabbits, ducks. We have a couple pigs. Uh, it's a, it's a. You know, we just had, we just brought home three barn cats. So we're we're in the throes of it. But that's that keeps us busy. That's after we're done here, we have to spend the entire day outside doing some work outside. <laughs> so that's nice, what I nice. do. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's neat. That's uh that's neat for sure. At where can they find uh maybe a little bit about your uh, Airbnb? Is it on Airbnb or Verbo? It is on Airbnb. Is it- yeah, a great okay. thank you for asking. Nobody's ever asked me that question. Um we we call it two wishes homestead. Uh okay. two T W O wishes homestead. The the thought behind that was, you know, you, if you don't get your first wish in your first marriage, you get your second wish on the in the second. And Dawn's an amazing woman. She's she's um, you know, supported me in my endeavors and help helps us. Probably eighty percent of the work for the Airbnb is done by her. Um, it's amazingly decorated too, by the way, because I didn't, I wasn't going to go to Home Goods or wherever <laughs> to get all of these decorations. She did it all. Um, so it's it's Two Wishes Homestead. We're on Instagram, and then if you search for Two Wishes Homestead. I think if you do that on Airbnb, it'll come up. I know it's Airbnb slash Two Wishes Homestead. I think, um, but yeah, it's cool. It's we, we're a great little spot. We there are forty wineries here in Ramona, so the big draw really? is especially during COVID. We had a lot of people coming down from Los Angeles because Los Angeles was very very much locked down, and it's a little bit you know you're not on top of one another here. There's much more room to roam, so to speak. So people would come down, and we were we were booked solid uh, throughout COVID. We spent a lot of time sanitizing the place, making sure it was everybody was comfortable. But um, there's 40 wineries here, so people come. You know, the husbands and wives, and they bring their kids here so they can play with the animals and what have you. And then they go off and grab a glass of wine and relax. Uh, but you you can actually walk to three wineries from my house, which is which is pretty cool. That is cool. Yeah, I didn't even realize I w- wouldn't have expected uh, down that far south uh, that there would be. But I guess it's still California. The weather's still great. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of like Napa got- Valley of the South. Yeah, yeah it's okay, it, it's cool. pretty cool down here. Yeah, it gets hot. It's 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 pretty hot today, but um, it's it's cool. We have a little swimming hole and everything else for the kids to play in. We're made out of a stock tank. Yeah, you should check it out. There's there's pictures online. Okay, cool. Sounds real good. Well, uh, I got two other questions for you. If you have just uh, just enough time for that, hundred percent. You're um, not kicking me out yet, so I guess I'm not. I guess this is going well. <laughs> it's going well. It's going well. Yeah. Um, I, this kind of may go back to sort of to what we had already asked, but uh, it's it's a question I ask everybody so mm-hmm. for somebody who's just starting out with investing. Uh, what advice would you give them? Keep it simple. Keep it very simple. It's easy to get distracted. It's easy to go to TikTok and have somebody telling you like the next thing you should be doing, which I see a lot of, especially around insurance. If you're 20 years old and you're starting off investing, you should 1000% not be buying insurance for yourself. Like don't fall into that trap. I see it all over TikTok. It's it's just bananas. You have non-licensed people 
talking about leveraging insurance and people are, you know, they're getting 10 million likes or whatever it is. And they're all, they become influencers because of it. It's just ridiculous. But I think, I think we just keep it simple, right? Like there's no reason why you can't just take a little bit of money and invest it into an S and P 500 index fund. That is a very, very low cost, almost, almost free. Uh, and just do that for the foreseeable future until you start to build some real wealth and it's time to start diversifying the assets that you have and, and spreading those out across the globe and getting access to international securities, things of that nature. But I, I think it's easy to get distracted, especially when you don't know what you don't know and you don't have the information to, and you're just learning, right? It's easy to say, let me try this thing or try that thing. And then next thing you know, you're going off the rails and the portfolio is all over the place and you're taking on too much risk. They just, just keep it simple. Yeah, I think that's really good advice. You know, I've, I've, been, I've really enjoyed our time together. Um, like I had mentioned, uh, the, maybe it was before the show started, but a lot of our guests have been on the real estate side of things. Um, and so this is great to get a little different uh, perspective and really hear about all the options that are out there because I'm a big proponent that you don't do you know, one or the other, I, I like to diversify, uh, in, in, I certainly practice with uh, 401k and stocks and, uh, have a little bit of crypto that hit that has not gone well for me. <laughs> that hit Luckily, it was just, a, <laughs> exactly. It's, it, it, I, I, I appreciate that. I mean, I think it's an, it's an, and strategy for everything, right? I don't want to do just real estate or just investing. I want to do investing and real estate. And that's that's yeah. how you really build true wealth. So, and I'm a big proponent of it. I've I've owned five or six properties over my my the years, and we've um, been a landlord a couple times. So, rent, it just for us, it just made more sense to get rid of our rental property and and put that money into the property that we have here on our land, and I can look out and I can see it, I can touch it, and see who's yeah. here and who's using it, and control that uh, control the controllables, so to speak. And we've made much more money off of that than we've ever did in the rent the, the rental that we had. But um, I'm a firm believer, and I love real estate. I think, it's, especially in different pockets of the country, it's a it's almost a no brainer, almost a no brainer. Yeah, yeah, for sure. What uh, what one last question for you, and that would just be a book recommendation. Anything that uh, you've read recently that was impactful? I, I've read two books that have been really really impactful. Um, one being. Um, uh, it's called the multiplier effect, the, and I have it on my bookshelf over here. I can't remember. I'm terrible with names. I'm the, like, I can remember faces. I will see you in Home Depot 20 years from now and go, I know that guy, but I won't remember right. your name. So I, I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna apologize in advance. But anyway, the 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 book is um, called the multiplier effect, and it's um, it was a book that I read not only during my leadership time when I was at Fidelity, but also uh, I I go back to it every so often based on the fact that I run two businesses now and I have employees. And the, the multiplier effect is the little things that we can do as an advisor. I'll, I'll give you an example. When I started the company, I set out to just be a solo guy. I was going to run my own show. I was going to take care of my 50 or 60 clients and I was going to ride off into the sunset. And then that changed over the course of the last year or so where I was able to have an opportunity to add some advisors to the team. And the multiplier effect is the work that I did by hiring those advisors. Now, instead of me having to only be able to help 60 clients, I can now help 300. Yeah. Right. And being able to man navigate those relationships so you can be impactful. And that's the reason why we read it then is because we were coaching and training advisors for Fidelity. And the concept was if we could just help them get better at their job to do the work that they are, they're hired to do and do it effectively and efficiently. And, and be, be happy with it, then we're going to impact so many more people along the way. And I think we did a pretty good job of that. The second is also another leadership book. It's called The First 90 Days. First 90 Days is an amazing book, especially if you're a first-time leader, because the mistake that we make as leaders is we, you know, we'll interview you, we'll hire you, we'll start to work with you and coach you and train you. And then we want to go and tell you exactly what to do and how to do it. Well, right. the reality is, is that if you just took the first 90 days to understand how someone does their best work, you can, you can match your leadership style with the, the level of development that they're at. 
and be able to either su to support and just be able to support them in different ways. If you have a 20 year advisor, you're probably going to need to support them and advise them and, and coach them in a different way than you are with somebody who just started off two years ago or this is their yeah. first job. Right. So and it's the same way in any business. If you have, you know, you own a restaurant or even real estate or you, know, you have young agents versus a 20 year agent, you're going to have to be able to coach them and train them a different way than you are for the person that's just starting off. Um, and that's that's where the first 90 days comes in. It's basically just observe, take good notes. So over the first 30 days, and then there's some structure to how you would approach those conversations over the last 60. So when you come back to giving them guidance, it's in a way that they can understand it. They, um, they, can, they can work better with that information. Yeah, that's uh, two great yeah, recommendations. I haven't, uh, haven't uh, read either one of those, so I will definitely check those out. All right, Jamie. Well, we're on a Saturday. I want to be respectful of your time. So, uh, uh, but I really appreciate again, uh, you being on the wealth flow and I think you've just added a ton of value to our listeners. Uh, so appreciate, uh, appreciate your time today. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to well, Let's do it again. Anytime you want. Sounds good. Being that you're still here, I trust you found value in this episode. I personally wish I would have known these guests and strategies when I started my wealth creation journey. Go to wealthflow.capital to subscribe to our newsletter. And as a free gift, we will send you our quarterly market report and the top 10 things to look for in an investment opportunity. Take a minute to give our show a rating and review. Help us reach a million professionals by subscribing and sharing this episode with someone you know who could also find value in it.